Thank you. You did great. You can, you can, you can hang out of that. She did awesome. Thank you. I call her Dr. Coach Katie, the Bible lady, because that's all the different hats that she wears worked into one title. Um, well, good morning, uh, church family. My name is Nate. I am one of the pastors, and we would encourage you like, uh, to prayerfully consider diving in and helping. Just I want to, statistics, I'm married to a data analyst. We can make those mean whatever. Let's do this. Katie, pay attention. How many of you would say, I came to faith 14 or under and was hugely impacted by student ministry, VBS, kids church, whatever, Sunday school, raise your hands. Yeah, tell me kids church doesn't matter. It's not, that's, that's all, that is by and far the majority. And so it is huge what's taking place back there. And so let me just pray for our kids right now and then we'll continue on in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, God, I thank you for our children. Father, I, I'm overwhelmed by the truth that you say, let the little children come to me. God, as much as we want to strive and love and glorify you by caring for the future generation, Jesus, your, your heart is deeper and your love flows farther than we could ever imagine for them. And so, Father, I pray that you would protect them. Father, I pray that you would rise up within this, this group right here, men and women, to fight for their young hearts. God, that you would equip a generation to battle sin and darkness for your glory. And so, God, I thank you for the faithful saints who strive to lead those children. God, I thank you for the parents who practice and model what it means uh, to follow after you. And so, God, would you just raise up that generation to be passionate followers after you. We need you to do it. That's the only hope. And so, Jesus, we, we thank you for the kids in this church. We thank you for the families in this church. God, we just pray that we would be faithful and obedient to love and serve well because you have loved us well. For your glory and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you, Katie. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 5. We, we started a new series last week uh, studying through the Sermon on the Mount. And our typical rhythm, our typical pattern is we teach through books of the Bible, but we're, um, we're doing something a little bit different in that we're not starting uh, in Matthew 1. We're picking up in the, the most famous sermon of all time. And so last week we tried to answer the question, why are we studying this sermon? Why not pick up in Matthew chapter 1? Why are we starting in the sermon that Jesus delivers, most likely traveling around giving to a handful of communities at different times and in different ways? That this isn't just one sermon, it's kind of a compilation of sermons that Jesus probably gave over and over again as he traveled with his friends and followers. And so why are we studying this? And one of the ones that that I just wanted to bring back this morning to remind us of is my hope and prayer is that as we study the Sermon on the Mount, as we listen to Jesus unpack the Word of God, that we would grow in our ability to handle the Word of God, that we would know how to read Scripture, how to make observations of the passages we read and how it applies to our lives, and then prayerfully determine how are we supposed to live differently? What do we need the Lord to do in and through us? And, um, and that's been just, that's really, for me, a growing concern that I have as we are a culture that really gets the information we need from places like YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and, and that we are losing the ability to sit down and read. We want the information given to us in a quick video. My family, we're a big board game family. We love board games in the Tyler household. And when we get a new game, I think there's a couple of ways that we go about learning how to play a board game. There's, there's um, the... And just see which one of these resonates with you. Uh, there's the, we'll learn as we play. Let's just get going. I don't want to read the instructions. Let's just go. How many of you? That's you. We'll learn as we play. 
okay, a few of us. There's others who you want to break out the instruction book and you want to flip through and, and hear even the backstory behind, like, why is our family packing up and building a train out west and, like, all of the weird stuff that they incur. Like, there's the readers. There's those of us who want to, like, and, and that's where I'm, yeah, that's me for sure. I almost, like, pull out a highlighter as I'm reading the instructions to a new board game. And then, and, and when it comes to board games, this is fine. My wife is, th- this is, this is now her category. I think she went home. Um, but uh, she is, she's got a YouTube guy that she follows that tells you in two minutes how to play literally every board game that's out there. How many of you are quick to go to YouTube or somewhere and be like, just give me the how to play the game. I don't want to read the booklet. I don't want the background story. Just show me the YouTube video. Yeah, that's more and more the culture we're a part of. More and more who we are becoming as a society is just give me the highlights. And I desperately want us to be a church that knows how to discern the word of God for ourselves, that we are growing in our ability to read the word of God and be transformed by it. And so that is one of the goals that we have in this series. And one approach we are going to take, and this has been present in and through the life of redemption. My watch is just driving me bonkers. Um, One approach that we have taken here at Redemption, it is not the only approach, but it is an approach. And so if you would say, man, I struggle. I sit down with my Bible, and I really wrestle with I feel like I read things and don't quite understand. I don't know what's going on. And I walk away feeling defeated. If that is you this morning, this might be an approach that could help fuel your appetite for the word of God. It's our road journal or our road approach or strategy. And and it's it's an acronym that just basically is saying, we're going to read the text. And this is what we're going to do throughout this series. And we're we're just going to ask, what does the passage say? And then we're going to strive to make some observations and say, what, what do we see in these passages? What words jump out? What phrases are maybe repeated? Are there commands? Are there, is anything pointing back to something else? Who's speaking and who is he speaking to? What's going on? What do we see in these texts and in this passage? And then how do we apply it to our lives? What should we do in light of what we just read? And finally, how are we going to determine prayerfully what we need? Where are we going to go to the Lord and say, man, we need to be different in this way. We need to be motivated to do this. We need your help. We need your encouragement. We need more wisdom or training. What do we need and how can we determine and make a decision to live differently? And so that's going to be the approach we're going to use this morning as we pick up in um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And last week we saw that Jesus gave us in the Beatitudes, the blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who are merciful, who mourn, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted and reviled and uttered falsely and account, and account for Jesus. And, um, and I probably forgot one or two in there somewhere. But, but in that, we saw Jesus was telling us how we are to live for the already but not yet kingdom of heaven. And we looked at the question, and this, was, this is not original to me. This is from that book that I referenced last week, Richard Rohr's um, Alternative Plan, that you and I live in the already but not yet kingdom. And we asked the question, well, what in the world does that mean? And we saw that the already but not yet kingdom, that you and I, whether you're far from Jesus this morning or you've been walking with Jesus for a very long time, you experience his presence and his beauty and his grace all the time. And he is constantly in this this pursuit of his people to show us his kingdom. And so we defined the already of the kingdom of heaven by those moments that you and I experience where we just never want them to end. Those moments where you just enjoy like laughing with your family until you have tears rolling down your face. That is the already of the kingdom of heaven. When you enjoy a really good steak, and we talked about a little bit last week, like God didn't have to make steak delicious. He did that to show off the kingdom of heaven. 
and it is designed to draw us in to deeper love and affection of him. But we also experience the not yet. And those are the moments, again, whether you're far from Jesus or you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, those not yet moments of the kingdom of heaven are those moments that we, it almost feels like we are hardwired to want to sprint through. Those moments of pain, those moments of stress, those moments of worry or fear or doubt, that promotion you didn't get, that car that you shouldn't have bought that now you can't afford, the, 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 the tension between you and your spouse or the way your kids are disobedient that leads you to wanting to pull out your hair, those, that fifth time you've had to sit through the red light on the way to work, those not yet moments that cause you stress and anxiety are meant to draw you into worship, are designed to stoke your affection for Jesus, because we look at those and go, praise God, this isn't all there is. Yes, this is hard. Yes, this is painful. Yes, this is stressful, but there's another kingdom coming. And so we live in the tension of the already, but the not yet. And for those who are far from Jesus, both of those moments, the beautiful sunset that you just never want to go away, And that stressful day at the office are meant to draw you to Jesus. And for the follower, the apprentice, the disciple of Jesus, that beautiful sunset and that bad day at the office is meant to deepen your love for Jesus and enhance your ability to glorify him. To allow you to go, God, you are so good even when it's really hard and even when it's really great. And just looking around this morning, if we could be honest, there's a whole lot of not yet in our church family right now. There's a whole lot of hard. There's a whole lot of pain. There's a whole lot of suffering. Life has been difficult. We have been persevering through a whole lot of not yet. And last week, Jesus showed us how we are to live, we're to be poor in spirit, we're to, be, we're to mourn, we're to grieve, we're to be merciful, we're to be willing to suffer, that this is our turn to persevere for his kingdom. But I'm so thankful that Jesus doesn't stop at how we are to live, but he wants to drill down deeper and show us why we are to live for the already, but not yet of the kingdom of heaven. And so, Here's how this morning is going to work. If it's your first time here, again, I'm Nate. I'm one of the pastors. I'm so glad that you're here, that you braved walking through the front door this morning or the back door, depending on how you look at our building, uh, but that you're here. But this morning might be a little bit different than you expected in that I want us to grow as a, as, as a people in our ability to handle the word of God. In some ways this morning, I want to work myself out of a job. I would love it if you left here going, what Nate does really isn't that hard. That I could read and make some observations and draw some application and live live differently, that seems doable. That would be the greatest compliment you could ever pay me. That we would be a people who know how to read and, and discern the word of God for ourselves. And so we're gonna dive in, but before I teach anything, I'm gonna give us just a few moments. And so if you have your Bibles, look at verse 13. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. You got a note sheet on the way in. That note sheet is mostly blank. That is on purpose. And I'm gonna give us a moment. You can look at the verse up here on the screen or in your Bible, and I'm just gonna let it be quiet. And I want you to see, what does verse 13 say, and what do you see? And if you want to make notes, if you want to highlight things, if, like, are there repeated words? Are there repeated phrases? Um, Is there a command? Who's talking? If a question rises up, write that question down. But we're just going to take a moment. We're going to read and observe the Word of God. And then I'll kind of bring us back in about one minute to kind of walk through what we see in this passage. But I just want you to practice this on your own for a moment.
all right, let's, let's ask the question, what do we see in this passage? Let me just read it for us. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I'm going to give us just a few observations that I have. And, and here's, if you saw something that I didn't, here's what I want you to do. When you go out after this service and you're getting your second, third, fifth, ninth cup of coffee and, and talking to somebody, share with somebody out. Don't jump to playoff football in the weather quite so quickly. You can get there. That's fine. But Share like, I saw this and Nate didn't even talk about it. God's word is rich. God's word is deep and living and active. And so if you see something that I don't talk about, praise God for that. That's him showing you something. That's such a cool moment to me. Don't gloss over that because I maybe said something or showed us something a little bit different. That's God speaking to you through his word and that's amazing. But here's, here's what I see. First off, Jesus is going to speak to their identity. He's going to show them who they are. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, you will become the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, you might become the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, you used to be the salt of the earth until you guys you know, fell off the wagon and became whatever. He's saying, you are. And last week, we looked at how God in the flesh, sits down and talks to his people. That God is looking out at this crowd. He's looking at his disciples and declaring, you are salt. This is identity forming for the disciples who are there. And for those of us who grow up, grew up in church, you may have heard this passage. Again, this is the most famous sermon of all time. And so you maybe have heard this taught and talked about as, as salt of the earth. We are to season our speech and walk in and be the flavor enhancements of the world and make sure we go into every situation and do our best to, to create a savory situation where Jesus can be, you know, flavorful or whatever. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I don't think that's what the crowd was thinking of when Jesus was talking about this. Yes, salt enhances the flavor, but at this, at this point, to this culture, in this context, the people who are listening to Jesus don't primarily think of salt as, ooh, this, these mashed potatoes need a little bit of salt. They don't have refrigerators. They don't have freezers. They don't have a deep freezer in the garage. When they go out and kill something and need to eat it, they use salt to preserve and protect their food, to keep rot and death and decay at bay. That is the primary function in the day and age that Jesus is teaching. That is, that is what salt was used for. And so culturally, they took great care to keep the salt pure. Because if the salt was contaminated with dust or dirt, or it fell on the floor, you wouldn't be able to tell, will this keep my family safe? Will it protect our ribs that we're going to have on Tuesday night for dinner? I don't know, so I have to get rid of it. It has to be pure, because the function is to fight away death and decay. And so as Jesus here is looking out at the crowd, he's using an analogy and he's telling them, your identity is as a people. You are empowered to go into the world and fight off death and decay. He's giving them a new identity. You get to go in and fight against evil, sin, and its impact. But also he's going to give them hope. And I think it's very easy for you and I to miss this here. He says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored. The people that would be sitting there hearing this, listening to Jesus teach about this, would go, salt doesn't lose its taste. That doesn't happen. We go to great lengths to protect our salt jar because it's so important. This wouldn't be a thing that they would have imagined. And so for the follower who's sitting there listening to Jesus, they would have felt hopeful. If I'm salt, man, 
I'm going to be preserved. I'm going to be protected. I'm not going to lose my effectiveness because that doesn't happen to our salt containers. They would have felt empowered and hopeful. These are a people who have lived under a persecuted rule and reign. They are anxious and eager for the Messiah to show up and free them. And here he is saying, you're like salt. You don't go bad. You don't go dull. You're not going to need. You are going to be empowered to go in and fight off death and decay. Your life matters. And so they would have heard this and been hopeful that they have a purpose in a dark and dying world. But also I see here that Jesus speaks to their deeper purpose. He says it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Again, had they spilled the salt and it had become contaminated, they would know that's not going to do what it's supposed to do anymore. We need to get new salt. Unfortunately, I think this passage has been taught and talked about in such a way that it gets misapplied. Jesus here is using a common everyday analogy to help people understand that they have a new identity and a new purpose. Why do they live for the kingdom of heaven? Because they have a purpose to fight against sin and death and decay. And he's using an everyday common household occurrence like salt. But in the church, we have taken this at different points in different places, and we have not understand, understood how to biblically understand the word of God, how to discern rightly the word of God. And this has become tied to, man, you should doubt your salvation. And if you're not living a salty life, you could get tossed aside. And that's not what Jesus is speaking about here. This is not a passage about the security of a believer. It is about the identity of those who follow Jesus. He is declaring, you are salt. It would be like if I had brought up, I don't think I did. If I had brought up, I have my iPad here. If I were to say, you are like the iPad of our culture. And you are meant to bring a gospel energy to our city. And man, you are going to make a difference and put him on display and shine brightly. And just make sure your battery's charged. Because if your battery's not charged, you're not going to be effective. That's, Jesus is doing that. He's saying, you are salt. You are meant to have a purpose in your culture. And just like the salt that falls on the ground or that becomes contaminated can't fulfill its purpose, you need to take care to watch your identity so that you fulfill your purpose. It's an everyday analogy that Jesus is drawing out to show them their identity, their hope, and their purpose. But that's not where the analogy is going to end. He's going to give them another illustration. And we're going to do this again. I want you to take a moment, read these three verses. As Jesus pivots, he's declared you are salt. Now he's going to declare you are light. Read, what do you see? What does it say? Take a moment, make some observations, highlight things, underline things, write down questions you might have, and then we'll walk through this second part. I know that wasn't enough. And if you're like, no, Nate, don't talk yet. Like, I get it. I live with my voice. I totally understand. Um, but go home and do more. Like, this is always available to you. Um, but what do we see in this passage? Let me read it. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's, who is in heaven. Again, we're going to see here that Jesus is going to speak to their identity. He says, you are the light of the world. I wish I had time to, to unpack all of the significance in the Bible of, of the idea of light. But as Jesus tells this to the crowd, they would have thought of all of the different places in the Old Testament where we see light tied to salvation, to joy, to hope, to uh, rescue and redemption. And this is such a biblically significant word that the idea that the common people who are gathered around Jesus, that his disciples who are being trained in this moment, that they would be light would have been overwhelming, would have been empowering. They've never been talked to like this. And then what's really awesome as you continue on in Jesus's life and ministry is he's going to say, I think it's in John 8, that he is the light of the world. And so there's even this beauty and unity that comes in the life of a follower of Jesus where we get to be the light because the light of Jesus is in us. That just as he is light, we, we get to be light as well. And so he's giving them again this new identity. And I loved a commentary I read this week said that if, if being salt was, was all about fighting death and decay and a little bit more on like the negative side of the spectrum. So my pessimists in the crowd, Jesus has something for you. It's like fight back against all the rotten decay and death and impacts of sin. Be like salt. And for the optimists in the crowd who view the glass as half full, you're like, man, life is great. Well, you are the light of the world. You are warm and shining brightly. The love of Jesus and the life-changing impact of walking with Jesus. And so it's like he's, he's using two very common things to speak to people who are all over uh, on their emotional impact. But he's saying, you are salt. Fight death and decay. You are light. Shine brightly. Be warm. Be inviting. Be welcoming in the dark places. Your identity, who you are, is a light to the world. He also speaks very hopefully, though, as he, as he again unpacks this common occurrence where he says, you are a city set on a hill, or a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. He tells them, you guys get to be on display for others to see. As your light shines, people are going to see it and seek it out. Just like, man, if you're ever driving in the middle of nowhere and you're like, if, if my car breaks down here, I'm not going to make it. And then you see a gas station, you're like, I'll live, I'll make it. Out in the middle of nowhere, like between here and there's a spot in Kansas where it's like there's just nothing for days except for like one rest stop where I think they could charge like 19 bucks a gallon for gas because there's nothing. But when you see that, you're like civilization, hallelujah. That's how they felt about a city set on a hill. They would see it while traveling and go, we'll at least make it one more day. And they would seek out the city or at the end of a long work day when the sun would go down and they would take their light and they would set it in the room so that community could continue to take place and they would be able to eat and be a family and enjoy time together. It was warm. It was inviting and welcoming. And Jesus here is saying, that's who you are to be. You are to be a light uh, that people want to be around, that people feel warm and welcomed by, that you are the light of of the world. There is so much hope in the life of a follower of Jesus. And then lastly, I see purpose. And this might ruffle feathers a little bit, but it's, it's a growing conviction of mine that our church just understands. Look at the purpose here. It says, so that you let your light shine. Why? That they may see your good works. There's an acknowledgement that people are watching how we live, how the disciples live. And give glory, if you highlight or underline, highlight, underline, star, circle, all the things, that phrase, give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Church family, our purpose is not to build a big church. Our purpose 
is not to grow a bigger budget by you giving in the offering. Katie, I loved your plea for children's workers. Our purpose is not for the best children's ministry in town. Here's where it gets uncomfortable. Our purpose isn't to see converts. It's not, we're going to have a baptism service in a couple of weeks. It's not to baptize people. That's not why we do what we do. We do good works so that God is glorified. Our purpose is his glory, not redemption, not converts, not disciples, not more children's workers, not to raise up healthy families, not to have healthy marriages. Do we need all of that a thousand times? Yes, so God can be glorified. That is so important that we know that. I wonder if you were to share with me the pervasive thought that if you just let your mind wander, do you go to your family? Do you go to your marriage? Do you go to work and that promotion you're striving after or that, that remodel that you want to do? What's that pervasive thought that just feels like it's always kind of rattling around in the back of your mind? The thing you dream about, think about, talk about, it just kind of comes out of you. What if, as we understood our gospel identity, who we are in Christ, that pervasive thought became, God, how can you be glorified in this moment? God, as I go to work, how can you be glorified? God, as I love my kids, how can you be glorified? How can you be lifted high? How can we make much of you? Jesus here tells them the purpose of your good works is that God would be glorified, that it would impact others for sure, but ultimately it's about the glory of God. And so what do we do? What should we do with this? Well, I think we need to embrace our identity We need to know who we are. We need to engage with others, hopefully, and then encourage others purposefully, knowing that people are watching, knowing that Jesus has decided you are going to be salt. You are going to fight death, decay, and sin. You are going to be light, a warm place of safety and refuge for those who are traveling, for those who are far, for those who are seeking, that that is what God has for us. We need to enter into those places where you work, where you shop, where you eat, where you play, where you live. I just did those backwards. That was pretty cool. Um, That God has you there on purpose for a purpose. We need to know our identity. And luckily, we've got a few really easy opportunities to do that. One, I said this earlier, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a baptism service. We're going to set up a little baptistry thing over here, and we're going to dunk some people. And if you would say, man, I am following Jesus imperfectly, yes, but man, I am a disciple, I am an apprentice, I'm seeking to grow and live for the already but not yet of the kingdom of heaven, and you've not been baptized, Like, this is my conviction. You don't need to pray about it. You just need to do it. Like, everywhere you look in the New Testament, when it's, we believe, what should we do? It's, oh, we'll get baptized. That's just the first step of obedience. And just imagine, like, you're saying, Jesus, I love you and I'm for you, but I don't want to do the first thing you ask me to do. That makes me uncomfortable. Like, if you've not been baptized, January 29th, you know what you're doing. Get baptized. Come talk to me or Jeff afterwards. Um, But that is an awesome opportunity to publicly shine bright what Jesus is doing in your heart. Also, though, I think we fight sin. We live salty lives. We fight sin, death, and decay. We shine brightly in the context of community. The way that we do community here at Redemption is through regroups, through our small groups. And those are restarting. Sean talked a little bit about that last week. But your, your best effort to grow in being salt and light is going to be in the context of community with other believers. And so if you have questions about that, there's a sign-up sheet also on that desk that's right on the other side of this wall. Or talk to Sean. You could talk to Jeff or I, but really just talk to Sean. He's our regroup coach. Um, don't come talk to Jeff and I. Talk to him. Um, but, but dive into community, to fight sin, death, and decay, and shine brightly. And then, maybe the easiest of all of them, 
is on February 11th, we have the opportunity. So we want to be a church that is about the things our city cares about. As much as we can, we want to enter in to a dark and dying world and shine brightly and fight that death and decay. And so on February 11th, there is a, a race, a four-mile race by Sweetheart City Racing, uh, Sean, or Sean, Shane, Shane and Sarah McWaters, who are members here, and been, I think we've, my family's known them longer than anybody in Loveland. They were like one of the first families we met when we moved here. Um, this is one of their, their races. Several hundred people will run this. Um, a couple of years ago, we ran it. It's a, it's a February race, so it could be beautiful and sunny and amazing, or I think two years ago, it was minus nine. And I got frostbite like on the top of my head. It was so cold. Uh, but it is, it, it's, a, it's a fun race. It's one of their bigger races that they will do all year long. And then afterwards, it ends at the Sweetheart Festival at the Foundry. And so if, if you want to, one of the ways you can just be salt and light is run this race. Just go care about something our city cares about. And if you're like, running sounds horrible. That sounds like the worst. I'd much rather watch cartoons. Is there any other way? Like, yes, you don't have to run. You also, we're going to have a booth at the foundry. And you could come just prayerfully say, Lord, will you open up conversations for me as hundreds if not thousands will gather downtown to sip hot chocolate and stand by heaters and just have a good time together. And if you'll notice this super sweet van uh, I, I'm arguing with my wife right now. I want that to be my next tattoo. She says no, so it won't be. Um, but I'd love that logo. If you notice on the van, that's our logo. That's the redemption R. We, wanted, we stepped out in faith as, a ch as church leadership and said, we want to care to the point of we are the title sponsor this year for this race. So this race that is incredibly popular in our city is brought to you by Redemption Church this year. So that is an easy way for us to be salt and light is just be present. Be present at the race. Be present at the festival afterwards. But let's be a church that cares about the dark and dying world that Jesus has called us into, that embraces our gospel identity. And I have to fly. Um, uh, I feel apologized by all the kids workers coffee on me this week. Uh, so, what do we need to do? Because that was like the intro to the sermon, guys. Um, what do we need to do? In order to do this, in order to embrace our gospel identity, our hearts need to change. Jesus is not teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, just willpower your way into new habits. He is going to drill down to why we do what we do and recognizes our hearts need to change. I'm curious, how does this quote that I read this week resonate with you? What we believe largely impacts what we do. Just, just think about that. What you believe informs and impacts what you do. And Jesus knows our hearts need to be changed. And so he doesn't just stop with you are salt and you are light. He speaks to our identity, but then he's going to reveal his purpose and his identity in the next section as really he's going to tee up the next few weeks as he digs a little bit deeper into some of this already but not yet of the kingdom of heaven. But look at how Jesus speaks about who he is and what he believes. He says in verse 17, he speaks to a belief. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Um, he's clearly discerning that as people are hearing this king who's saying, live differently, in, that, are, that are embracing uh, this desire to, to have a different ethic, to approach life different, to live salt and light. They're eating it up. They're soaking it up. And they're going, we have been oppressed by the religious leaders, so maybe we can do away with the Old Testament. And Jesus here, he speaks to a misbelief about the Bible. He's saying, no, 
I've not come to get rid of the Old Testament, the law or the prophets, but rather he speaks to his belief. I've come to abolish them. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He believes he is fully capable of doing all that God has promised in his word. We see his power, we see his conviction and his belief that he can accomplish all that the Old Testament plans and promises. That Jesus has come to fulfill them, to complete the order. And then I love that Jesus here speaks very believably. Listen to his passion. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus believes he can do what he set out to do. Or another way to think about it, he finishes what he started. He's going to accomplish that everything matters and Jesus is going to see it all accomplished. And so that means what we need is to believe the right things about Jesus because that informs what we believe about the Bible. And that's where Jesus goes next. He acknowledges that that there are people who believe the wrong things about the word of God. And he's training the disciples here on how they're to teach going forward. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one 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 of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I think for you and I to have a heart change and to really understand our identity, we need to come and acknowledge what do you really believe about the word of God? Are you one who maybe would be tempted to relax one of these commands, to say, you know, there are parts in this book that are old and antiquated that we don't need them anymore. Not that they were fully fulfilled in Jesus, but that there are parts that, man, science has taught us or enlightenment has taught us and reason has taught us, and so we don't need those anymore. What do you believe about the Bible? We need to acknowledge our belief, and really, we need to come to a place where we accept what Jesus says about the Bible. He says here that whoever does them, the Word of God, whoever does these laws and commandments and and teaches them will be called great, in the kingdom of heaven. When it comes to the word of God, Jesus has a very high bar. He believes and he praises those who walk in obedience, who take the word seriously. We need to be a people who take the word seriously. We need to follow in Jesus' footsteps and have a high view of scripture. And I don't have time for this, but I feel the need to share it anyway. As much as I would love to look around this room and know that we're all just going to do life together and add some families along the way, but you guys are here and we're going to row together and fight death and decay and darkness and be salt and light and all of that. Like the reality of being here the last seven or eight years and just seeing how God cycles people in and through the life of redemption is the reality is a year from now, Some of you, if it's like the last couple of years, most of you probably won't be in this place anymore. And as hard as that is for one for for me, I, I feel called to stay. If I could just encourage you, wherever the Lord might lead you, if this is your first Sunday here and you've already decided that guy talks way too long, I'm never coming back. Um, wherever you end up, end up at a place that thinks much of the Bible that thinks high of the word of God, that really believes and wants to train and teach you how to grow in your love and affection for Jesus and his word. Don't go to just a place that tells you you're awesome and you don't need anything. You're the problem. You need Jesus. You need his word. 
Let's not, let's be people who don't want to relax the word, but like Jesus, have a high view. And then that empowers us to have his attitude or his behavior towards the word of God, which isn't about just surface level, but it's about heart change. And that the jaws of the disciples would have fallen open at verse 20. He says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They would have fallen over. There's no chance if I need to be holier and better than the professional pastors and small group leaders who have it all memorized and do this super well, I don't have a hope or a prayer. But Jesus here, his behavior is the word of God is meant to penetrate your heart. It's meant to create a heart level change that allows you to live in the already, not yet of the kingdom of heaven. And so if we are to make a habit of living out our gospel identity, our hope, our purpose, and our identity rooted in Christ, we need a heart change when it comes to biblical truth. I was sneaky. Those are two of our core values we find here in the Sermon on the Mount. We need to be a people who believe the word of God and are informed about who we are from that. And so... We live for the already not yet of the kingdom because we believe our identity flows from biblical truth. And so this morning, as we prepare for communion and as you're determining, what do I need to do? I'm gonna invite the praise team to come back up. If you're sitting here going, I don't know if I know who I am. My identity doesn't feel like it's rooted in Christ This is a passage I'd like you to take this week, make a note, and just read it, make some observations. What do you need to change? What do you see? How does it apply to your life? And what do you need from the Lord out of 1 Corinthians 15, the first six verses? If you don't know who you are, read that and just ask the Lord to show you what needs to change. But this morning, if you're like, man, I don't know that I believe the Bible, I think I'm one of those, one of those th- that could be guilty of relaxing the word of God and saying, I don't need to listen to that anymore. Praise God for grace. And I love that Bonhoeffer calls that cheap grace. Um, and soak in Psalm 19 this week. Read it. Make some observations. Draw some application. And then prayerfully determine, Lord, what needs to change in me out of Psalm 19 to grow in your love and desire for the word of God? But I want to bring us back as we prepare for communion. This is not a list of do's and don'ts. This is not a list of rules and regulations. But let's remember as we prepare to come to the table and celebrate that all of this finds its yes and amen in Jesus. That we do all of these things, not just for good works, but so that God is glorified. So over these next few moments, as you prepare your heart to come to the table and remember the God whose body was broken and blood was shed in your place for your sin. Let this time of communion this morning be a time of saying, Jesus, in this moment, how can I make much of you? How can we glorify him in these next few moments? Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement to be a people who know who we are in you. And so Jesus, I pray over these next few moments as we prepare our hearts to come to the table and commune with you. God, for those of us who would say, yes, I am following Jesus and I want to know my identity. I want to know truth. God, would this be an opportunity to glorify you to make much of you, Jesus. God, if there's someone in this room who's wrestling with their identity, wrestling with belief, who would say, no, I'm I'm far from Jesus. Lord, I pray that in these moments, they would be able to sit and watch the family of God glorify you, Jesus, and that that would be an already moment of the kingdom, that they would experience your beauty in these moments, and God, that that would lead to life change.
So Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we seek now to glorify you by communing and remembering a God who held nothing back from us. Would we hold nothing back from you? It's in your name we pray. Amen. When you're ready, you can make your way towards the front and...